Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Fantastic. Well, welcome to our talk titled uh, Champions of Skills. And thank you for attending. For the next 75 minutes, you'll be listening to a series of thought-provoking talks meant to highlight bold, innovative ideas. The Champions of Skills series will focus on how, in this age of hyperconnectivity and rapid transformation, we need to become lifelong learners who continuously develop and practice core character traits and skills. In this session, our incredible speakers will share their personal understanding of skills and how we should rethink the way we teach and learn such skills. Their talks will focus on how they've identified a skill gap in their environments and how they've decided to turn that into an opportunity. The focus of this talk reminds me of a quote, skill is the unified force of experience, intellect, and passion in operation. I've had the great honor to spend some time uh, with our colleagues and speakers, and I'm quite excited for you all to learn from them. As we hear from our speakers, I encourage you to consider how you are currently champion of the development of skills in your environment and the lessons that we can learn from what we hear today. And just a note, each speaker will speak for around seven minutes, and then I will come back up for some Q&A for you to um, interact with each speaker. So our first speaker is Gilad Babchuk. Gilad is the co-founder and executive director of Groundswell, an alternative business school that has pioneered a new way to support aspiring entrepreneurs and individuals whose goal is to develop their ideas and turn them into sustainable social enterprises. They take a holistic approach to education, incubating the individual, not just the idea. With an ecosystem of support, Gilad, the floor is yours to share your experience. Thank you. I sound so important when you're talking about me. It's feel great. <coughs> so my name is Gilad and I came to Vancouver, Canada uh, seven or eight years ago. And as you see, it just won, I think, to be the, the best city uh, with quality of life uh, in the world. But it's like any other city. We have two cities uh, in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, the gaps that we have uh, in every city we have in the world, and it's just you know, it, it just gave me a lot of frustrations. And it was, uh, I came with some privilege, so I had some time to think about what I want to do, and uh, we established a, a cafe in the, in, that, in the neighborhood that you see from the right. <clears throat> and we start to figure what people uh, want and what they need, and uh, with that we start to learn about, about the, the future. And the, the, the main thing that, 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 we, that we got, it's uh, uh, that the skills, uh, and I'm going to say something uh, uh, that contradictory to the, to the aim, uh, we, we got to the conclusion that skill, it's not the gap. The gap that we have is with the will. We, we live in the time, and it's go just going to go harder and harder. And if, if technology is going to keep moving on, uh, skill will become commodity. So when we commoditize skills, we came to a really, really uh, 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 uncomfortable situation because people, we educate people to please authority through our education system. So hopefully if you, can, if you can please authority, you can find a job. And then we give people skills. And when we give people skills, they identify with the skill. So most of us, when you ask what you do or who you are, we're answering with what we do at work. And when people identify with the skill, when the skill be commoditized, they will feel left behind. And when people feel left behind, they have the tendency to vote for leaders that offer vision in the past. And I think you know what I'm talking about. So we live in a time that, that, that is really uh, beca became a, a big problem because the, the main issue that we have uh, and we're going to deal with is the will. We will be living in times, in, in, in a decade or less, in some, in, in some spectrum, in some, some places, we're already experiencing that. For example, when I came to Vancouver, every block had a travel agency. Now they're all gone. Once we all trust the AI and we book travels to the, through the AI and then the computers, no travels agency. So it's going to happen again and again and again. And people are going to learn how to code. And after three years, the machine is going to do it better than them. So the main thing that people will need is to reinvent themselves. That will become the will or the adaptivity 
or the, or the process that I, I cannot identify with my skills anymore, create a new situation and the new challenge is reinventing yourself. So how you reinvent yourself? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge question. And might be, it might be frustration, <laughs> process that ca cause some frustration. Uh, uh, the only way uh, for me to think about alternative way is to think about how we can reinvent ourselves via repurpose ourselves. So basically what we start to develop is what we call the pedagogy of purpose and ethics. Because if you need to repurpose yourself every two or three years, that might be interesting. If you need to ask yourself every two or three years, what is my current purpose? And how I want to uh, deal with life, what I, what I want to put my energy uh, in the last few, uh, in the last next, in the few next years, that might be a very interesting journey to have. And you're gonna feel less forced to do it uh, 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 and, and, and more enjoy in that, find more joy in that. So basically what we created uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a business school that see the stuff in a very uh, alternative way. Uh, we teach people to redefine themselves and, and reinvent themselves to find their own purpose. And then we teach business as act of self-expression. So as, as you said, we incubate the person and not the business idea. So we're asking ourselves in, in the new time when everybody needs to be entrepreneurs because this is the new reality. Just to let you know, in Canada, by 2022, 45% of the people are going to be self-employed. The markets are changing, jobs are taken away, and people will need to take care of themselves. So the main challenge we have is to change the narrative about being entrepreneurs. In today's time, entrepreneurs, symbolized by Mark Zuckerberg and, and Steve Jobs, and lots of people don't self-identify as entrepreneurs, but we will need to create the livelihood entrepreneur. To create the livelihood entrepreneur is mean that everyone, we need to hold this, the hold this radical belief that everyone can be entrepreneur. And, 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 and in the search for, uh, you know, provide for themselves and for the family and in the search for meaningful life. Uh, and what is meaningful life? That was the main question that we asked ourselves. And, and we, 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 what we thought is, if you figure your purpose and you, you find through that problem that you want to solve, and then you find a way to express yourself while you're solving the problem, pro program, problem and you add value to others. We thought this is really meaningful. If you do something that you care about, you fully express yourself and you add value to others, you have meaningful life. And if that can be pay the bill, pay the bill, that can be amazing. So basically, that's what we build, and, and uh, it was quite of a journey. Um, uh, we, had, we have today uh, 240 uh, businesses in this community. After five years, we start very, very small and redefine and play with curriculum and, and see what's work and what doesn't work. Uh, and, and now we, we cannot reach the demand. Uh, we have many, many uh, uh, people who want to join us program and, and we're trying to place them in, in, in that place. Uh, we have 25 cities currently that want to duplicate this model and we don't currently know how to do that. Uh, because it's more than a school, it's a culture. When, when people, uh, and I think the main thing that, that's happening there, when you liberate people uh, to dictate success on their own terms. Part of the, of, of the problem uh, that, that we're having in, in, in our culture that success defined by someone else for us. Uh, and and th this liberation of, of people to define what is success for them and then make it happen is, 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 is a big choice. So just, just to go in less than we, uh, one minute is uh, the, in the right uh, up is Conlan. Uh, that had very hard uh, upbringing, and he, he was, has a passion about uh, being a coach for youth at risk and uh, First Nations uh, uh, people, and create this gym. Uh, I'm training there uh, myself. We employ now four or five people uh, in the gym, and they have uh, a system that basically on every three times that I do personal development there, they do pro bono. Uh, a class. We have Trixie from the left that basically established a, a cafe that employ uh, uh, refugees and uh, women and they celebrating uh, culture and food and basically it's better for me to stop because that might be asked to do so. Um, 
I, I'm going to ask myself a question about data, and I'm going to say that we have 70% uh, females, 40% uh, newcomers and refugee, uh, lots of people that basically marginalize, and lots of people of privilege uh, coming uh, uh, to our school. Uh, and yeah, we have a very diverse, uh, interesting community uh, that provide ongoing support to these entrepreneurs. Fantastic. Thank you, Gilad. Uh, we have time for uh, maybe one question. If anyone has a question uh, for Gilad, I know I do if, if we don't have any um, in the audience. Great. I'll ask mine. Um, so you, you talk a lot about will. So when I think about will, I think about motivation, right? Within motivation, you can think about choice, persistence, effort. Do you believe or do you, does Groundswell believe that that's something you can teach? So can you teach will? Can you teach motivation? Uh, what are you finding with that? Obviously, uh, I think all, all the curriculum of, of purpose uh, 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 and, and the mental health component and, and you know, our self-esteem, all the, 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 the machine, the drive behind us, all what making decisions behind what we formally learn <laughs> is the piece that you're talking about and this is the most important piece. So having self-awareness, have radical reflections, have peers that you can share uh, with them, have a, a, have, a, 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 have a generous place to be in, uh, and the ability to be vulnerable, and just to talk about this stuff. So take the jargon out of the, out of the room and just left with people that trying to do good for themselves and others. This is, this is the most uh, important thing, and, and it's there all the time. Most of the problems coming from there. You look at the first, world problem, again, I live in the city that just chosen to be the best city to live in the world, and what I see around me is depression and anxiety, and you know, it's not, it's not so fun. So I think that, that is to be dealt with anyhow, and when people, more and more people being forced to be entrepreneurs, this real muscle is the main muscle that we need to have to be happy, and I think that is a nice segue for the next one. Fantastic, thank you, Gilad. <laughs> I think the notion, um, while we're transitioning to the next one, I think uh, the notion of incubating both the individual and the business uh, really truly supports the whole theme of the summit, right? What it means to be human and how we can really reframe what we do and focus on the human side of that. Uh, so our next incredible speaker is the former Minister of Education of the Royal Government of Bhutan, Dr. Takur S. Padial, uh, uh, Professor Padial, is an educator by choice, conviction, and passion. His major interests include gross national happiness in education, moral literacy, institutional integrity, and national self-respect. He is the author of Write a Vision in My Green School, which is being translated into other uh, languages, uh, where he expresses his vision of holistic education. So please join me in welcome him, uh, welcoming uh, Takor. <laughs> Good afternoon. Sorry. Many years ago, when precision equipment of the type that we have today were not invented, sailors and mariners lost on the wide open seas looked at the North Star to find their direction to the safety of the port. In the 21st century, we are very busy with our machines, uh, smart equipment. Uh, we may not have time to look at the North Star, or to the sky, to the sun, and the moon, the stars at all. But uh, I believe that uh, even in the 21st century, in fact, more so than ever before, we continue needing the North Star for our own lives, for our societies, and for our nations, as indeed for the world. For Bhutan, His Majesty, the fourth king, identified a North Star. He called this North Star Gross National Happiness and declared that Gross National Happiness is more important than Gross National Product. And if a nation has a big dream, as indeed every man, woman and child ought to have a dream, big dream, if a nation has a North Star, the subsystems of that nation ought to embrace and advance that North Star, that big dream. And education is an extremely important subsystem of any nation to take the nation forward. 
Any nation doing well in education will succeed. Education failing, no nation will succeed. That is the bottom line. Therefore, in uh, 2009, the Ministry of Education in Bhutan decided that uh, it ought to do its part to advance the big dream of the country. And we launched a nationwide educational reform initiative that we called Gross National Happiness. And the instrument, the strategy to implement this program of educating for gross national happiness was identified as nurturing green schools as a means to an end, and the end was supposed to be Green Bhutan. So nurturing green schools for Green Bhutan was our strategy. I have to explain what we mean by green or greenery. Green is a color, but more importantly, it is a metaphor. Green is a metaphor for anything and everything that supports and sustains life. And by life, we mean human life, animal life, plant life, bird life, reptiles. Life in all its multiple forms, in the sea, on land, in the air, and in between. So anything that supports and sustains life in its infinite variety is green. So why not a green school, a green college, a green university, a green economy, green parliament, green politics, green legislature, green society, a green nation, a green mind, a green thought, a green idea. So green is anything and everything that supports and sustains life. So what makes a school green? We have um, conventionally limited our um, growth or rationale for education as uh, the sharpening of our brains and skills. And we have attributed all the qualities of um, education and uh, limited it to the intellectual IQ, intellectual intelligence quotient. And over time, we have added uh, a few others. We have uh, decided that uh, there are other domains called the emotional quotient or social quotient. Still, this is not multiple intelligence enough. There are so many other elements that make the life of a learner. Just as indeed, there are so many elements that make the life of a society or a nation. So it is unfair and unjust that we limit our teaching and learning, the whole education process, to simply sharpening our brains and skills as important as they are, preparing young people for careers and for the employment market as important as they are. We have to take the child, the learner, as an entire being in his or her whole dimension, whole form and capacity. That's why we feel that uh, we have to take care of uh, man many other important dimensions that make us who we are and that make the learner who he or she is. So first, we have um, the most important dimension. The first important dimension of um, our relationship between us, the learners, and uh, and the natural environment is the natural dimension. We have to develop what is called um, an ecological intelligence. IQ is not enough, EQ is not enough, SQ is not enough. We have to develop an ecological intelligence. Today we are panicking because of um, global warming, climate change, mass movements of people. There are developments taking place in the natural world like never before. And at this rate, we are going to panic even more and uh, future generations will suffer even more. That's why a fundamental principle of education ought to be understanding and respecting this relationship between us, the human beings, and planet Earth, Mother Earth. So ecological intelligence has got to be extremely important. Uh, the next is so social uh, intelligence. Uh, sorry, I think it's all coming together. Um, we have um, social intelligence uh, that uh, we know, I think, um, um, quite a lot about uh, now, but I also feel that uh, there's what is called um, cultural, cultural intelligence. Culture is the way we are. Culture is the way we declare who we are. Culture gives us those foundations, points of reference. So it's extremely important that um, young people are able to learn, uh, learn cultural, cultural intelligence. We have intellectual intelligence, academic intelligence, aesthetic intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and above all, 
moral intelligence. So if we have these eight elements of a green school, we feel that uh, we have a good education system. Teaching and learning becomes respectable, purposeful. It makes us more human. And I believe we need to unlearn this uh, mind-dominated, intellect-based um, process of learning that has uh, been our saga for so many years. We have to go beyond. We have to relearn the fact that we are human beings. The most highly evolved of all the human beings. In my language, in, in my country, Zangka, we call human beings Milu Rinpoche, most precious human being. All life is precious, but human life is the most precious of all. So to be human, we have to rediscover, reaffirm, and reassert that we are the human of the species, homo sapiens, the finest gift of God made in his own image. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. We actually have time, uh, Professor Paul Yudoff, for a few questions. Are there any uh, couple questions in the audience for our incredible speaker? I know I, I have a lot of questions, so if you all don't mind, I'm going to ask one. Um, oh, over here. Perfect. There's a mic uh, right there if you want to use that. Uh, it was a nice presentation, and uh, the way you have presented was fantastic. But uh, still, we need to balance. Uh, we, we learned some uh, new terminologies uh, from your uh, uh, slides. So uh, Bhutan is a, is a beautiful place, but replicating the same on the other part of the world, uh, we need to see a balance between industrialization, modernization, and then greenery. So how, what is your take on that? And, and when I saw the North Star, today we, see, we don't see North Star. One of the reasons is that uh, we are, the environment is polluted, right? So how do we balance th uh, that? I think um, every nation has to find its own North Star. Every society has to find its own North Star. Just as indeed, as men, women, and children, we have to have our own dream. So it will be difficult for us to really um, advise any society to follow this North Star or that North Star. The idea ought to be to take lessons from history, to take lessons from the past, even from the present. What is happening to the lot of human beings? What is happening to our environment? And if we go at this pace, there will be nothing left for future generations. As you know, in many parts of the world, water is becoming undrinkable. Air is becoming unbreathable, life is becoming unviable, and the earth is becoming unlivable. There are enough lessons. How do we balance the need of the body with the need of the mind, with the need of the soul? I think there is something. I think I answered that. Okay. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Great. There's one more over here. Is there a mic that we can hand to her, please? Thank you. How do you measure the gross national happiness? Of, uh, of Bhutan. I mean, we know how we measure the GDP of a nation. So what are the criteria that you use to measure the gross national happiness uh, of uh, Bhutan? Uh, thank you, ma'am. This is a question that we keep getting, um, uh, we keep receiving all the time. How do we measure happiness or gross national happiness? Because over time, we've got a custom to measuring everything. And uh, we feel that even happiness ought to be measured. However, if we start measuring everything in life, uh, including happiness, happiness ra tends to evaporate. <laughs> how, how, however, that is not an answer. The answer is that uh, our architecture of gross national happiness is built on four pillars. And the four pillars are called bringing about balanced and equitable socioeconomic development, Conservation of the natural environment, preservation and promotion of our ancient culture and heritage, and finally, promotion of good governance. These are four pillars, or these are the minimum conditions that we feel our government must establish. And, uh, and these conditions ought to bring about a sense of uh, well-being and happiness uh, amongst the people. And these four pillars are broken down into nine domains which are further broken down into indices and sub-indices. We have what is called the Center for Bhutan Studies. It is something like a think tank. And this think tank carries out regular surveys to see as to how the people of Bhutan are doing, which district is doing better than others. 
Our employed people are doing better than the un unemployed ones. Are women doing better on the happiness scale than, um, than men? Young people as opposed to the old ones. Um, housewives as opposed to the office goers. So there are several indicators to um, see as to how the country is doing on um, different uh, scales of happiness. Thank you. So if we could end on the spirit of lifelong learning, and I know happiness is really complex, right, in just what you, you mentioned, in the, in the spirit of us being lifelong learners, if you had to say one thing, if you had to tell the world one thing about happiness or one way to grow in that space, what would that be? Go slow. Ah, yes. Fantastic. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. David Osher. He is the Vice President and Institute Fellow at the American Institutes for Research. His expertise includes social and emotional learning, school climate and conditions for learning, as well as school discipline and safety. His work builds upon the science of learning and development and aligns research, policy, and practice with a focus on equity and quality outcomes. He will share with us lessons in order to improve equity through social and emotional learning. David, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm also honored to be here. Um, education is what Paula Freire once talked about as being humanization. And I want to tell a story that's based on my humanization, which is in part how I learn more about other people and extend myself. Um, um, and what I learned um, is what I now know we know about in terms of both the science of learning development and about implementation science, but that's not where I'm going. Um, by the time I was 30, I'd accomplished a lot. I was already a dean. Um, I had you know, come from an Ivy League college as a working class kid, had done successful organizing and felt good. But what I'm about to tell you is how I really started learning. Um, so in a college that I was dean, we created a school. We created a, a, a program that became a school for working class people. And even though I had been working class people, I had not grown up poor, but these were people who did grow up poor. And they were people of wonderful talents. They were very, very diverse. I'll give you three people. Um, Dick Monahan, living in white guy living in rural New Hampshire. Sawa Abdullah, um, a Muslim woman um, living in Boston, Massachusetts. Maria Barrero, a Puerto Rican woman living in Hartford, Connecticut and um, wonderfully talented, all of whom had lousy experiences with schools that really didn't respect them, that did not respect their families, and did not respect their possibilities. Um, and if we were to be able to help them succeed, we had to create an environment where we understood their knowledge, their funds of knowledge, where we ended up understanding their context, where we ended up having to create conditions where, because this was our goal, they could learn from each other so that they could work together in order to create a better world. Initially it was the United States, but then we had lots of international students as well. And it's from learning from them and what succeeded that I understand what I'm talking about today, which is about the fact that um, if we want people to learn, we have to have strong conditions for learning. They have to feel emotionally safe. They have to feel identity safe. That they have to feel like they have a membership, that they belong. They belong as learners. They belong in a place. They belong together. Uh, that they belong together in history. They have to be challenged that we took them seriously. We took them as people who did not just need to know skills, but also who could critically analyze things. And we acted in a culturally respectful manner for them. And at the same time, we supported the development of aspects that contribute to the motivation, to, to what you've heard about before. That we focused on issues that relate to understanding and managing yours and others' emotions and relationships and being culturally competent in your work when you work with others and listen to other people. 
And so I'm now going to give you um, an example of some of that work and how I learned. Um, and how am I doing time-wise? For four minutes. Okay. All right. So my first slide now. Okay. I want to take you to Cleveland, U.S. Um, Third world in the north. You know what? We got the wrong city. No, I think that is Cleveland, but let's not, let's, I, that's no time. It is Chicago, of course. That's from, but th imagine it's Cleveland. The difference is Cleveland is smaller and poorer, and I just lost 30 seconds. Okay, okay. Um, we developed a survey there that we then used in Cleveland. All right. In this poor city where the graduation rate in 19, in, in 2007 in, in was less than 35 percent, um, great amounts of poverty, there was a shooting. And they asked me to come in with a team of people from AIR to try to help them. And initially, I turned them down because I thought they wanted a symbolic report. And they said, no, we were really serious. And when we did an audit with them to learn their own context and listen to them, we ended up saying that there were a lot of things you wanted to do, but among other things, you really had to build conditions for learning, and you had to support the social and emotional competence of the young people and teachers. And what has happened over the decade, as they have done the work, we have supported them a little, but they have done the work, is in this city, unlike other cities, including unlike Chicago, but if you want a city like Detroit that is equally poor, they've been really transforming their school system and the experience of young people. So one of the things is that work like that can be done, and it also can be done internationally. And in fact, I've done that work in other places. But whether I'm working in Cleveland or Chicago, or if I'm learning, and this is Bangladesh, that's what I want the second time, is that ultimately you have to adapt to the local context. And that's the same as if I'm working in China. And I can tell you that the way in, is, that we have always worked is to really work co-constructively. And out of that, we also learn more. But we don't go in and say we know everything. People wanted us to come in because we do know something about conditions for learning or social emotional learning. But because we honor and learn from them, what happens is they develop a capacity then to implement th th things in their own way. And at the same time, we learn more about things. And that's the most important thing. Um, you know, there's somebody who wrote a book once with, or a, a, a discussion with Paula Ferrari na um, named Miles Horton. And both of them got honorary degrees from the School of Human Services. And Miles said that ultimately, education is not what you say, it's what the other person learns. And in the work we do, it's not what we do, it's what people do with us, which means respecting their context. And in different ways, their context helps them develop the type of motivation, but also the types of capacities in their context and in their organizations so that they can realize what they want to do. And I thank you for being here, and I think I ended in time. You did a good job. Well done, David. Uh, we have a, a few minutes to take a couple questions from the audience uh, for David. Not about Chicago, though, right, Cleveland? Anyway, we started the work in Chicago. <laughs> Any questions? I have one. Uh, so you talk about um, strong conditions for learning, and often we're talking about, you know, in the classroom, right? So I know some of us are educators here. Some of us are, uh, you know, perhaps policymakers. Right. Some of us are parents. So if there's something that you could, you could tell people, so with regard to per, per helping support strong conditions sure. for learning, right? So what does that look like if we take that home as a policymaker or a parent? Or Definitely. Thank you. Okay, okay. of course. Um, and just to know, I actually think the conditions for learning are actually conditions for thriving in human development. They're not just conditions for Fantastic. learning. But two years ago, I had the privilege to be funded to really look across many, many sciences and disciplines about what we understand about learning and development, where knowledge converges. And the there are two bottom lines. One is, if we want to be very, very scientific, um, there's neuroplasticity and epigenetics trumps genetics, which means we have great possibilities. But the other thing that was key is that it is relationships that drive change and learning. It is relationships that support people. 
And what is necessary for parents is our ability to and teachers to connect with our children and with each other. But what is important for policymakers to do is to understand that not only are children whole people, but they interact with other whole people who interact with other whole people. And so if we want people to succeed and thrive and create gross national happiness and greenness, then what we have to do is really support people's ability to connect and attune with each other and support each other. Fantastic. And that's doable. Thank you, David. Oh, we have one more question. Let's take one more question. Do you have a mic uh, for the front? Oh, sorry, over here. Okay. And we'll take yours as well. Uh, <clears throat> so what is like context-specific learning? Uh, like a couple of examples, say, in Cleveland versus, say, sure. Bangladesh right. or Chicago? Let's go back to the picture, OK? <laughs> this is a great question. OK. Uh, I've got to go the other way. I'm sorry. All right. In what should have been Cleveland, th they chose, we recommended a social-emotional learning program to do universally. They chose a program called PATHS. And one of the things that PATHS does is to help people, young people, understand their own emotions. And what they have is, one of, they, one of the things they do is kids have feeling cards. I feel happy now. I feel sad now. When we were working co-constructively in Bangladesh, we didn't say do this. We en ended up giving people examples of programs, and they decided they wanted to adapt that one strategy from that PATHS program for Bangladesh. But in Bangladesh, where one of the challenges is speaking in public with your emotions, what would happen, I just didn't have a better picture than this one to take, is that each of these children stood up and said, I feel scared today because of something. And that was important to them within the Bangladeshian context because of the fact that it could help develop the skill there. I hope that helps, but that's just one example. Or, or just, to, just to know that our Chinese colleagues took a model of social emotional learning that still is pretty individualistic in the highly individualistic US and applied it to the Chinese context where it was less individualistic. They were still using the under. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. It says stop, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, but I think you get, the, the, and I'm happy to talk afterwards about the fact that it's that type of adaptation. But let me just add that even in Cleveland, if you're doing that work, school by school, you have to adapt, and every kid has his own or her own context, too. Great. If you don't mind, we'll save your question uh, for after for David. Fantastic. Okay, so you. You, to recap, before we transition to our next speaker, you know, we've heard about the power of will, the power of patience and going slow, the power of relationships. So next we're going to transition to the power of words. So our next speaker uh, is uh, Charles Othiam. He is the uh, managing director of a nonprofit providing free creative writing programs to French children, teens, and young adults. Under his leadership, the organization has grown from a local nonprofit to a national organization. So he will share with us uh, his experience in trying to foster a new approach to writing for French youth and how these skills need to be fostered as they make us uniquely human. Charles. OK. Just before I start, I'd like to get to know a little bit about your own writing. So I'm going to ask you three quick questions. And uh, if you can raise your hands for the positive. Uh, who here knows how to write? OK. I'm assuming the ones that are not raising hands and that were raising hands for questions either don't know how to write. OK. Um, other question, slightly different. Who writes on a regular basis? OK. And last question, who likes to write? Okay, so you're very, very, very different from me <laughs> and from the people I work with. Um, I'm going to take you through time a little bit, so you have to find me on this picture. Um, that's back in 1994. I was, I was initially raised in France, I'm French, in Paris, where writing is taught as a very technical, not creative at all, uh, discipline. Um, I was 
quite a bright student actually up to uh, seven, eight years old and then I had to move uh, with my parents to the US and that's a photo from the yearbook of St. Bart's in Maryland where I was studying in fifth grade. And what I discovered there, I had to learn English from scratch, but I discovered that I not only had English class, but I had writing classes, and I found that quite, quite surprising. Um, took a lot of pleasure in it, and two years after that, I was taken out of the American system and put back into the French system. Uh, and there I had a lot of difficulties <laughs> to readapt because I was missing on some of the fundamental techniques of writing in French, and my French teachers were only interested in me performing correctly on spelling and grammar and not so much looking into my imagination or my creativity. A couple of years later, in 2011, I had the opportunity to start a nonprofit which is called the Story Lab, Le Labo des Histoires in French, which basically provides free creative writing activities for children. Um, and the interesting aspect of what we're trying to do is we're doing it as a collective experience, okay? So most of what we do, roughly about 2,500 workshops a year now, are collective writing workshops. And as you'll see here, most of the children aren't writing because in our purpose, writing isn't so much about holding the, the pencil or the pen and the paper, but it's really about producing stories. Stories that are personal and stories that are also uh, collective. This is in, in Chaligny, in the east of France, quite an underprivileged area. That's the first center we opened outside of Paris. And as was said earlier, we've opened 12 centers since. One in the Indian Ocean, in an island called Réunion. One next to Brazil, in French Guiana. One in the Caribbean, and the rest in uh, continental uh, France. We target mostly underprivileged children, not so much underprivileged as you would assume, but in their relationship to writing. And that can be of many sorts. Uh, children that are currently in hospitals or in detention, uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, children with different dys dyslexia, dysorthographie, uh, dyspraxia. And um, we try to, to find where they are and to provide them with activities. Now, after looking at writing as a as a collective activity, we, we try to take it to, let's say, another dimension. Um, uh, because a main purpose of what we're trying to do is to make writing fun. Uh, so many of you were raising your hands when I asked you if you enjoyed writing. I don't know if that's to please me or if you really do. But if I go in a classroom today of teens, 14, 15 years old, and I ask this question, if one person raises their hand, it's a miracle for several reasons. It's not that they don't like writing, but when you're 14 or 15 years old, acknowledging in front of your peers that you like writing is something very difficult. So what we're trying to do is to change the perception that children and their educators have of writing. And to do that, we need to make it emotional, not just fun, but emotional. I'll talk to you about a fun th story, but we do it as well in, in not so fun uh, stories as well. This is the 12th of April, 2017. The guy behind, Thomas Pesquet, is a French astronaut in the International Space Station. And 12th of April is the Yuri's Day. It's the day where we celebrate the first flight of Yuri Gagarin. And on that day, what he's doing, he's actually reading the stories that won the first creative writing competition from space. When we learned that Thomas Pesquet was taking a book of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry in his luggage, he was allowed two kilos of luggage, he took a saxophone and a, a book of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, we called him up and said, you know, Thomas, once you're up there, you'll have a lot of time, why not launch a creative writing contest? And he says, of course, I mean, I have time to spare, we'll do that. He launched it, 8,500 stories arrived from 78 different countries, and here he is reading the story of a kid from Hong Kong imagining a new planet. That was a great, great time. Moving in time to a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a creative writing workshop. doesn't really look like it. These are children in Réunion, this little island in the Indian Ocean. They're doing a creative writing workshop on an important story. Uh, since we've built our network and done all those workshops, now we're trying to say creative writing shouldn't just be about making it fun or changing the perception of kids about writing. It should be using the power of the community that we have to get children writing about important topics. So the SDG framework for that is very useful. This 
is a writing workshop on SDG 14. So SDG 14 is life underwater. We asked two very famous yachtsmen, the French yachtsmen that had the world record in sailing around the world, to launch from the sea a creative writing workshop asking children to talk about water and life underwater. So here they are at a turtle observatory learning about turtles and that the, then they'll write their own book about their experience. So moving to today or maybe to tomorrow, writing is a fabulous experience because it's an unknown experience. I have a couple of questions of what I'm going to do next, don't really know. We can continue to grow this organization in France, but what I'd really like to do, having the opportunity to travel so much, notably in developing countries, I'd really like to take this in countries that most need it. I hope we can continue the conversation orally or by writing, thank you. You know, Charles, I, I, I loved how you were talking about writing is not just that physical picking up a pencil. It reminds me of something I read once that talks about how story is the communal currency of humanity. So it's incredible to see that you are promoting that and utilizing the space to really connect people through story. So with that, we'll take um, maybe one or two questions uh, right here in front. Do we have a mic that we can use? She's coming with a mic right now. Mohammed and Miski, thank you so much. It's very deep. Uh, so, if I understood you correctly, so the power of words and power of writing is very liberating. Uh, I, I just want you to reflect a little bit on the liberation, but at the same time, the, the, the need to also observe the formal uh, requirements of what's called effective writing in business. H how would you align these two? Do we take the second question or? Sure, uh, sure we'll take the, uh, the second question and then. Um Thank you, Shigeo, that's my name. Um, thank you very much, very inspiring. I'm sure you must have been asked, so what does technology do to creative writing? I've been asked, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll go, go to the first question. My, my work, my interest is really in changing the perception. The, the, the people that work on actually helping and crafting the way children and teens and young adults write, those are the teachers. And I'm also trying to change their perception on writing. What we're trying to say is if you take my nationals, French, we're very good in international statistics at decoding words, but trying to understand the actual meaning, we're quite weak. And that's why I think it's important to look at the, the actual technical writing. Is it correct? Is it, is it formal? Does it meet the requirements that are expected? But it's important for us also to challenge in educational systems the relationship that teacher and students have to writing so that they can also develop other skills. And not only write perfectly very neat stories, but that are not interesting. I prefer stories that have imperfections, like we had in the plenary introduction, the vase, uh, the, the stories that are imperfect but are, but are human, okay? For technology, what I would say, last year we had about 30,000 kids that came to our workshop. They're allowed to write whatever form they want. They can take their smartphone. There's always a, uh, pencils in the middle of the room. I have almost never seen a children write on his tablet, his, uh, his smartphone, or his computer. So today, I wouldn't say that the, the art of writing is disappearing, at least not in, in my society. The other way around, what we're doing, we've launched last week uh, uh, the first creative writing competition where children will be invited to write to an intelligence of the future, so to technology in reality. So I'm not so much interested about will children forget to write because they're used to having smartphones. I'm more interested in can student writing help us understand what children have to say about technology and all that we've been listening in this conversation. We'll follow up later, I think I have yes. to stop. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Charles. And it's also interesting when you think about the, the power of words in our current climate and context and in, in, in different things that are going on in the world. And um, I think about uh, the profound um, words of Rumi, and he says, raise your words, not your voice. It's rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So your work is obviously supporting uh, that incredible idea. Our next speaker um, comes, from, uh, comes from Kazakhstan. Uh, Dr. Aida Sagantayeva. She is currently the dean in the graduate school at uh, the university 
Uh, she has been working most of her career in the higher education system, first as a teacher, then as a vice rector, and finally at the Ministry of Education and Science, focusing on Kazakhstan's higher education system and moving it towards the European three-tier degree system. During her talk, she will share the story of the inception of her university and specifically the context of the skills that are taught there. Aida, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking hosts for inviting me for such wonderful event of uh, celebrating the value of education. I believe that it's not just people who should cultivate skills of relearning and unlearning, but also institutions. Because institutions are people who form the community of professional learning and practice. And my story will be about the building of such institution. The theme of this year why summit could not be more relevant to my social context and the region where I come from. After the unpredicted dissolution of the Soviet Union, Kazakhstan has to develop its own post-socialist transformation to, uh, to, to, to stay competitive internationally and to survive as an independent nation. But it worth to mention that education has always been the main pillar in Kazakhstan's vision. Breaking away from the command and control mindset, both in economy and education, uh, the Kazakhstan higher education sector had to disrupt rather than incrementally uh, revise uh, uh, incrementally revise the uh, development of future leaders. And this is why uh, th this was done by creating the autonomous educational institutions as Nazarbayev University. The story of creation in you can be best described as a Greenfield project. And if my colleague said green is alive, I uh, have borrowed this term from the field of construction, where the Greenfield are pioneers, they are scouts, they are always at the far front and they are examples and beacons of how you should work or how you can work differently. Greenfields always allow you to do what is impossible to do in brownfields where everything has been already built. Adapting a special law that granted institutional autonomy and substantial funds allowed us to establish the flagship university using the approaches, de approaches described in Jamil Salmi's book. It was a necessary step to disrupt the existing systematic problems using by or um, just unusual and extraordinary approaches. But it would be naive to think that um, changing the legis legislation may um, help to, to, to overcome all these challenges. The main challenge for us, and is still the change, is the mindset shift. The mission of Nazarbayev University as Greenfield, as Greenfield is to learn from the world's best educational practices and technologies to mediate them and to disseminate the local pro practices across the country. The combination of these conditions has formed unique ecosystem for Kazakhstan, which nurtures graduates with the competencies to create a welfare, so welfare society uh, based on a developed economy and the possibility of universal labor. The uniqueness of our university lies in sharing of adapted international policies into the mainstream of higher education and the transfer of knowledge between the international researchers and researchers and professors of my country. Today in the uh, NU, 75% uh, of the faculty are international and about 470 professors are coming from 55 countries of the world. And uh, surely, at the same time, the university works very hard on developing the local capacity, introducing various professional development programs for its staff and uh, uh, giving a chance to get the international degree of master's or PhD abroad. A new encourages students, a new, oops, sorry, 
So a new philosophy can be presented by three eyes, innovations, integrity, and inclusion. Innovations. Right from the start, a new chose to find its own model of building strategic partnership with the leading and the best universities in the world. Nazarbayev University is not an international branch campus, it's a national brand. Integrity in teaching, administration, and students' lives. It advocates academic integrity, research ethics, and the shared values of merit, respect, trust, transparency, and accountability. Inclusion. Social responsibility and inclusive society are reference points of the university core principles. A new encouraging students and faculty members to participate in professional associations, volunteer activities in charity events, and to develop a culture of global citizenship. As future leaders, students take responsibility for their knowledge, uh, for, for their education, and uh, they also responsible for the use and transfer of their knowledge, abilities, and skills to others uh, after graduating from the university. Mentioned ecosystem merges a generation that is able to transform a society and to lead where a new look is needed. Here is one of the stories about the graduate of the inclusive education program of my school, Aijan Aljanova. She is a mom of a child with special needs and uh, she funded the Mama Pro NGO. Uh, usually there is a range of programs supporting the kids with special needs, but if you analyze the situation, the parents' needs are unfortunately are often ignored. No one pays attention to their needs and their demands. And Dajan decided to make the company that would pay attention not only to the kids, but to their parents and especially moms. She, the company, um, uh, the company uh, provides uh, just moms as Aijan with just with the children with special needs, free education on entrepreneurship, brand promotion, social media marketing, accounting, computer literacy, and uh, get employment assistance also. The fund has initiate uh, the fund uh, has united 120 mothers uh, last two years, and uh, she opened also co-working center for mothers upbringing such children. Uh, last year it was um, nominated at the best social project in our capital city and recently Aijan was uh, invited by the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women to in New York where she presented this project on behalf of Kazakhstan. And within the knowledge and skills which she gained from a new professors, she is able to help many families and children to find a way to harmonious life and development. And uh, I do strongly believe this is the power of education, knowledge, and inspiration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aida. It's exciting to hear that um, you are part of really creating the modern education system in Kazakhstan and the role that the university is playing. Uh, well, we have time for a couple questions. Any questions for Aida? We have one right here. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for informing us about the university. Actually, I have been uh, in Nazarbayev University. It is a wonderful place. Thank uh, you so much. My question is, as you said, it is going to be local. Uh, for long-term plan, is it going to be again single leading University of Kazakhstan or uh, do you have plans to multiply the same success story across the Kazakhstan? Is it going to be uh, one university in the future or are you going to multiply campus or <laughs> branch? So maybe the President Katsu knows better the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> But my understanding that we, we, we were created at the uh, universities that could share our experience and we're working a lot on sharing experience, not only the academic and the research and uh, just the social responsibility responsibility of the university. The social agreement the w that we have signed with the uh, government shows the long-term perspectives of the university in making this. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Aida. I think it's so interesting and completely on plan, this theme of green, 
You know, so we heard from Paul Yudal about green and whether it's Bhutan or Kazakhstan, there's this common theme and I think it's just an incredible reminder that we're all in this together and we're more alike than different, which is pretty incredible. So thanks for that reminder. So our last speaker, uh, so to conclude this talk, we have the pleasure um, to hear from Jeremy Lamry. He's the head of innovation research and perspective at Job Teaser. Jeremy's expertise is on the future of work. Before his current position, he was the founder and CEO of Monkey Tie, a recruitment website that takes into, into account the personality and interests of candidates to enable recruiters to identify people who share a genuine affinity with the culture of the organization. Can you hear me? <laughs> Jeremy, whoo, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I'll use my teacher voice. at you. You did start an innovative school. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me okay? This was not on either. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, where were we? Uh, so Jeremy is uh, currently completing his PhD in cognitive science. Oh, finished. Congratulations, doctor. And during his talk, he will connect his findings from his research and his vision for the future of work and the skills that are necessary. Jeremy, please join us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to all the speakers. So um, I think I'm going to modify a bit my initial speech because some of the things were, were, were said before. And actually, it allowed me to, to connect to something more. We say that we need to develop soft skills, that education needs to teach soft skills. And that was the, the departure from my PhD. Because I just wondered. What the hell are these soft skills? <laughs> what, are, wh what are these soft skills? Wh what are they? And uh, what are they composed of? And uh, so my PhD was uh, about the relationship between the 21st century skills and performance, and professional performance. How are they related and how they interact? How do these, these different skills interact with each other? So I got interested in four skills in particular. Creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. And we actually challenged this model to, uh, to find out that the 4C model could actually be a 3C model. But I, I won't spoil it. Uh, I, I'll leave that for later. No, during this PhD, it gave me the opportunity to actually um, take the time for a lot of questions that I didn't take the time to ask myself before. Um, for example, who is the smartest person between Neymar the football player, and Einstein. I can tell you that 20 years ago, let's say 30 years ago, before emotional intelligence and all this, the answer would have been quite simple. People would have said, in, 21st, in the 20th century, would have said Einstein is the smartest because of what you said, everything about like the, this called intelligence, everything about neuronal speed. Uh, but now people would say it depends for what? If it's for playing football, Neymar is, is, is smarter. And if it's for uh, doing equations, then Einstein is smarter. And then I started to get interested in multiple intelligences. So the Howard Gardner theory about the nine, uh, nine types of intelligence. And I just wondered, so somehow we are all wired differently, but in nine different ways. So we're kind of the same. And this, the, the, the way we are wired, it defines actually how we learn. Because it defines our perception. It defines what we take and what we don't take. And it defines how we use it. And I ask myself, OK, but how is it that we, are, we, we can be that similar and that different? And then actually, um, I, I, I got into a lot of history. Um, I wrote a book to put all that because it wasn't allowed in the thesis, because it was only psychology. Um, but what I could find out is that actually everything we have now, these multiple in intelligences, it's competitive advantage from the past. In the past, we were weak. So we, the human is stab stabilized with sedentarity since 10,000 years, let's say. Before that, 
we were in nature and we were weak. We were, we were struggling for survival. And so, we, let's say we're secure, more or less, since 10,000 years. And in this time, the brain didn't have time to evolve. Meaning that we are still wired for one thing only, survival. The brain is not designed to work in a huge tower for business or whatever. The brain is not designed for literature or for nothing. The brain is designed for survival. And in survival, the brain is able to see two things, opportunities and risks. And that's how we learn. We learn whenever we see an opportunity or, or a risk. And we learn under stress or motivation. And basically, is that the time passed or left? Yeah. Left? OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's almost half, so it's OK. <laughs> and uh, and we, so we, we are wired. Um, we, we are wired for survival based on uh, risk and opportunities. And when we ask ourselves, actually, who is the smartest person in the room between Einstein and Neymar, uh, it comes back to long ago. Taking the framework of these nine int intelligences, because uh, I, I, I really like it, the first one is the logico-mathematical intelligence, the intelligence of the 20th century, the one when you can calculate, when you can make concepts, you can abstract. And when you do that, actually, in the 20th century, you are considered smart. But in reality, this type of, of thinking is developed, naturally developed, for only 40% of the population. But this is the number one requirement at school. So, the second, um, so, uh, and why, so why do we have this? Because at some point in the past, being, to be, uh, be, be, uh, being able to distinguish what's right and what's wrong is the difference between life and death. The second one, uh, the, the, the other one is social intelligence. So the second one is uh, linguistic uh, intelligence. And basically, if I tell you that this room is dark or this room is black, for some of us, we'll say it's the same, don't bother. But for, for, for some other people, no, there's a slight difference. Dark is not totally black. Black, black and black is, uh, is darker than dark. And uh, you would say, yeah, OK, it's just words. But actually, the words we use define the, comp the, the understanding we have of the world. And uh, this is also a particular type of intelligence. And 300,000 years ago, back at the beginning of Sapiens, when we were to actually form groups, we needed to uh, be able to express ourselves to find the, run, the, the, the right words, to find allies. Those who managed survived. And this type, of in, uh, this type of intelligence then survived and developed. We have the same with other forms of intelligence, interpersonal, intrapersonal. Then we have what we call natural intelligence. And that's actually the, the, this type of intelligence that made me make the link between this and evolution. Natural intelligence is the ability to distinguish the differing living forms. For example, you see two mushrooms, and for you, they are exactly the same, but not for your friends. He, see, he sees the slight differences. And this type of intelligence in the past, making the difference between a cat and a tiger, was the difference entre life and death. And they're the same with what we call today musical intelligence, but it's auditive intelligence. And then we have uh, what we call kinesthetic intelligence, spatial intelligence. These two intelligences are the intelligences of football players. Ability to move your body in space the way you want, and uh, ability to see the movement in space. And the last one, existential intelligence. Well, this one, I, I guess this is why Gartner consider it's not an intelligence, uh, because it's very particular, more recent. It's our ability to ask questions about anything but ourselves, the why, the why thing. And I believe if we're able to put that into education and link that to neurosciences based on uh, evolutionary principles, then there is a way we can actually rethink uh, education and development. That's a stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have, we have a couple minutes here for any questions uh, for Jeremy. A fresh PhD, we've got to have one or two questions, right? We've got all that knowledge in there. 
So if you had to give us a 20-second, um, 30-second kind of synopsis overview on going back to your research, and you shared some of that with us, but if you had to give your elevator pitch to a complete stranger on what your research findings were or are, what would you say? Um, that if we, if, if we need to summarize the soft skills, it's the ability to learn, think, and interact, very simply. And uh, it can be uh, splitted into two types of um, what we call skills, but are more capacities. The first one is behaviors, the second one is aptitudes or abilities. And uh, behaviors, we think, we thought that we could develop them the way we want all our life. It seems that a part of it is genetic and another part of it is epigenetical. So actually our, our personality is for most of it um, defined before our birth. But the abilities can be developed, the cognitive apti uh, abilities um, are, are not genetic at all. Uh, less than 5% of our cognitive uh, development is genetic. So the thing is that uh, intelligence seems more and more related to behavior, which lays down the question, uh, is intelligence, as the compilation of both, more genetic now than, than we know that behaviors cannot be changed that much? Right. Fantastic. Any other questions? All right, perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. So in this talk, we heard from founders, trailblazers, researchers, CEOs, directors, deans. Uh, and it was just incredible to hear their stories and how they're truly championing uh, skills. So our hope is now you decide and, and take back to your environments that where you identify skills, you know, I, you now identify opportunities. So we want to take this moment to thank Wise for putting together this incredible panel. If you all join me in, in uh, giving them a round of applause one more time. Thank you.